right, everybody, this is it. Are, are you ready for this? Because Thanksgiving has concluded and Christmas season is upon us. It is a crazy time of the year. I, Christmas to me is second to Halloween, uh, but, you know, it's still fun. And I've spent the last couple of days when I've been cleaning my house or cooking or doing whatever, I've had a, <laughs> a cheesy Christmas movie on in the background. I, it just it just happens, and this is the time of year where I just I dive right in. So uh, this is my official welcome to the Christmas season for the podcast because there's going to be some uh, some Christmas related episodes coming up here in the next few weeks, and yeah, I, I'm just super excited. One of the films that I cannot wait to see uh, that is Christmas related and is in no way, shape, or form cheesy whatsoever, but will be distinctly badass bloody and just amazing is violent night now it's david harbour as santa claus i don't need to see i don't need to see i need to see everything i don't need to say anything else it's going to be an amazing film i'm so freaking pumped up for it and that is why i'm so excited to welcome the screenwriters of violent night pat casey and josh miller not only because they have written my most anticipated movie of the year but they are also the screenwriters of Sonic the Hedgehog 1 and 2 and a plethora of other films and TV programs made within the last decade. They're awesome. They were so much fun to have on. Uh, we had a short amount of time, so I couldn't get into you know a lot of stuff that I wanted to get into. But hopefully they can come back onto the show because these guys are just grand. They're <laughs> just they're they're really fun to talk to. I feel like I was in a writer's room. So um, I can't I, I can't say any more. I just want to get right into it. Let's sit down, guys. Let's grab some. I mean, if you like eggnog, grab that. But let's get some hot cocoa. Let's get some Santa Claus Christmas cookies. And let's sit down for a chat with these awesome fellas, Pat Casey and Josh Miller. <laughs> Uh, I am Josh Miller. I am a filmmaker, but largely a screenwriter. And uh, I'm Pat Casey. Same thing. We are a uh, screenwriting team. Duo. One and that's <laughs> we wrote, uh, most people know us for the Sonic the Hedgehog movies and for Violent Night. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, one, finding a screenwriting team that still works together years onwards is really hard to find. So I want to go back. How did you guys connect? How did you guys figure out like, oh, we're we can easily write and make stuff together. When, when, and how did that happen? Was it college? Was it earlier? When, when it was that take high schools, really, when we like creatively joined forces. I mean, it's funny. I feel like as time moves on, this becomes increasingly harder to contextualize and explain to younger people. But in the nineties, our town had a public access channel, which was like funded by the city school system that would show, you know, high school football games and band concerts and stuff. But some maniacs a few years older than us had started a live like variety show that was on Fridays at midnight. And you'd call in, you know, it's like Wayne's World, I think, is maybe a touch point people can still understand. And we each watched that show and we're like, we could do this better than these guys and kind of each separately approached the guy who ran the station, who was like the one adult there. Everyone else was teen volunteers with like, you should give me and my friends our own show. And he was like, why don't you um, join the show we already have and make stuff for them? So we we joined the cast of that show when we were freshmen in high school as sort of uh members of rival camps actually and then pretty soon we joined forces to kind of overthrow the seniors and take over the show so we've been making stuff together uh since we were yeah th i don't know 13 14 it was ridiculous oh my god that's i mean that's a, probably the longest relationship you've had in your your lives right <laughs> At this Outside point now, like, family, yeah. I mean, the <laughs> yeah. thing is, we're we're still friends with all the people we did that show with. So, I guess in the number of years, uh, we're, but yeah, as far as like super close friendships, uh, I mean, Pat, we also have siblings. I guess that always kind of makes it complicated. <laughs> I don't think your siblings like to hear that somebody you met years after they were born is more important than they are. But it is yeah. true that Josh and I have now been working together for so long that we are also effectively siblings. Yeah, uh, totally. <laughs> That's, how, that's really how I answer. People are like, is Pat your best friend? And I'm like, I mean, I feel like it's sort of gone beyond that at this point. 
I could just see you looking down during a junket going, yeah, I mean, we've been working together for how long? I think we're, I think we're, we're there. We've yeah. made it. We made the press. <laughs> yeah. We so, broke through the other side. I, uh, I caught a glimpse actually of you guys in the, the Severin, um, cellar, like going oh. through <laughs> movies and stuff. So, uh, I grew up watching like obscure horror movies, like the Wraith and, uh, the unnameable. And then like early nineties movies, like sleepwalkers, so like, where did you guys find kind of commonality in bonding within these like weird horror films? You remember the first one you watched together and just thought like, this is it? I don't know if we could remember the first one. Our town, we're from a suburb of uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, and there were two video stores kitty corner from each other at an intersection that both had competing like two for one Tuesdays. Uh <laughs> And so we would like, I feel like, especially in summers, I guess, because we didn't have school is when we'd really get into it. And we'd often rent like four movies and watch them all in one night. And they were always horror movies. Um, and I, so I guess that was kind of like a trial by fire. But everything we were doing on our, our our public access show, you know, was often kind of, I mean, like any sketch show, we were kind of doing parodies and aping the things we were watching and liking, which definitely skewed towards genre films. Yeah, like definitely weird. like a lot of horror comedy is what we like we watched a lot of horror movies and then we made horror comedy type stuff and uh like our sketches tended to get extremely cinematic like when we first started we were trying to sort of do like saturday night live type stuff and then we realized like oh it's like those guys are all world incredible performers and we're not yeah we're we move the camera a lot uh then we can really <laughs> make something we, we can make up for our lack of acting ability you know yeah I mean, do you guys still have copies or evidence oh, yes. of those previous? You do? Yeah. No way. I used to have a huge trunk. And I think our friend Sean, who's uh, in Minnesota, maybe still has them. I gave them to him at some point. But I had a huge trunk full of the tapes we recorded all the episodes on. Because we used to have like 10 tapes and we would just re-record like you'd get to the end, but then at some point we're like, why are we even recording these if we're just <laughs> eventually recording over them? So then we started buying fresh tapes like two years in. So I think a we had a huge like, expense for us at that time. Yes. <laughs> where are we supposed to find eight dollars? Yeah. Are we made of dollars. <laughs> you know. So I, I do want to like jump ahead to you writing, you know, these feature screenplays and selling your first one. We don't have to talk about what the screenplay was, but <laughs> Sorry, Pat. But uh, what was the process like for you as far as like selling your first screenplay? Because I think that's one thing, you know, as a screenwriter myself, we're that those days are pretty much gone as far as like selling something and getting it made. So how did you guys navigate that? What was the process like? I mean, if you could. Uh, I mean, that's one of our great, like unhelpful to aspiring people <laughs> stories because it's so <laughs> specific and weird. And it'll never work again. Uh yeah, you know, when we first moved out to LA, like I was working at a video store and Josh was working at a sandwich shop and we were just existing off of free sandwiches and free videos while we wrote scripts. And I figured some of the people coming into the store worked in the industry. So I would just like chat with people. And at one point a guy came up and he had a big stack of zombie movies. And I was like, but they were like such the standard zombie movies. I knew this wasn't, he wasn't just having a zombie marathon. This was yeah, he was research. doing the research. <laughs> <laughs> So I was like, you gotta be, you gotta be working on a zombie movie, right? He was like, yeah. And then he gave me his card to hype his latest movie. And I was like, my buddy and I are screenwriters, you know? And he was like, oh, you have any great scripts laying around? And I was like, yes. Um, so Josh, I, I called Josh, who was at home and was like, he asked to see our two best scripts. So we did a little debate about what those were. And, <laughs> and then Josh ran them over to his office. And then they called us like the next day, maybe even later that day to say they wanted to buy the script that would eventually become National Lampoon's Dorm Days, which is not exactly a masterpiece, but we did sell it and it got made. <laughs> yeah, we heard got, it. Heard, yeah. At that point in our lives, we because we would write movies and then make them for like $200. So we didn't really have spec scripts. And that was just the script that we tried to make in college in Pat's dorm and just had failed so it never existed so we just had yeah, we were gonna shoot it like during the school year with like all other students as cast but then we realized people had classes and stuff they didn't have they didn't have time to, to act in a feature film yeah it was uh, poor planning on our part yeah ironically <laughs> the other script we sent them was a zombie movie and i don't think they ever even read i don't that think one. they did because they didn't really <laughs> want to make a zombie movie was what it turned out 
Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, it's like you never know, right? You just throw yeah. whatever you have. Like, I've made 50 of these. Just pick whatever you want. And they pick mm-hmm. like this, <laughs> you know, uh, romantic comedy horror set in Rome, Italy or something crazy. That's just, you know, <laughs> off the cuff. But yeah, I'd watch uh, that movie. <laughs> I, uh, I'm really interested to hear about uh, Golan the Insatiable and how that came to be because now we're talking animation. Seems like you guys have always, because we'll get into Sonic here in a second, but it seems like you guys have always had that sort of animated like i I can see josh behind you there's a bunch of you know well that's golan back there (laughs) yeah right there man so like what was that process like as well i mean were you guys working on that for a while or was it something that uh you were just pitching in a room and then had to develop as the you know days went on well that's another again kind of unhelpful uh well it's actually not enough because i think the moral of this story is make things and put them out there so because the last movie we made in college before moving out to L.A. was called Hey, Stop Stabbing Me, uh, recently was- re-released for its 20th anniversary by Severin Films on Blu-ray. Um, Get in a plug there. And that actually <laughs> got released on like DVD, which was super cool for us at the time. That was our first like, you know, thing we made that wasn't just getting shown to our friends. Uh, so even though hardly anyone saw it, it still felt legit. But that one movie was kind of like it didn't make any money and it like, you know, led to nothing directly. But like after we'd been out here for a few years, we started to slowly discover that it did have fans, especially fans within the industry who would often track us down. And so I guess shortest version of this story was just that the people at a website tracked me down to see if I wanted to write funny stuff for them. And Golan became a character on that. And then Pat and I had another friend named Dan Belgoyan who worked and still works for the Whites Brothers companies, the guys who did About a Boy and American Pie and separately have done a zillion things. Um, but uh, Dan was always like, you should, you and Pat should turn that Golan character into a TV show. And, and we, we were like, like, yes, we would love to do that. How, how, yeah, how do we do it? We were, get in the door, we were you know? so on the fringes of the industry doing these like dorm days movies and stuff. We're just like, I don't, I mean, you let us know. And then like after a couple of years, he finally did. He was like, hey, Fox is trying to do their like own, you know, adult swim kind of like knockoff late Saturday nights um, because of the price point they were going to be doing for these. They were very specifically like, oh, it'll be cool if we kind of try to work with more like up and coming people rather than just, you know, AKA plucking people somebody. that they could get away with hardly. Paying. Yes, exactly. That's the uh, <laughs> but and that so, was us. <laughs> yeah. And Dan got us in there to pitch it. Uh, and I think they saw potential and went for it. And so that was, that was like super exciting because we'd never done anything that like not mainstream content wise, but like industry wise. Yeah, That finally sort of allowed us into the lo- more legitimate side of the industry. Like we finally got agents and could get <laughs> meetings with real producers. Uh, so that, that was really like the, the, big changing of our careers just being and it was one of the first things at that studios. point really it might have been the first thing since hey stop stabbing me uh where it, it kind of felt like not like we got to do whatever we wanted but it wasn't like we were just writing a thing and handing it to somebody to rewrite or you know do whatever they want with the tone um it was kind of like oh yeah like if you liked hey stop stabbing me this is maybe the first thing we've done since then where you'd be like ah yes it's a josh and pat project yeah it really finally felt felt like us uh which now i mean stuff like violent night also feels very much like us which is very very nice well and keeping the chain moving forward it Mm -hmm. was toby asher uh went on to become producer of sonic the hedgehog franchise he was a fan of golan so that's why he wanted to meet with us and then that in a roundabout way led to us getting on sonic yeah, it, it you all know, started then, with "Hey, stop stabbing me," <laughs> <laughs> which I uh, I'm looking forward to watching. Having seen one clip of someone <laughs> just saying "quit stabbing yourself," it, I <laughs> lost my fucking mind. Um, but uh, when it comes to Sonic, I mean that's a huge property to to take over. But I heard and slash read in an interview that you guys basically said like, "Oh well, we can do this easily." Now, was that just something you said as a immediate response, and then freaking out afterwards, like, "How do we do this?" or like, how did you approach I mean, writing yes Sonic? and no. I think the one thing that really bonded us with, like, Toby and, you know, 
Jeff Fowler, the director, is because we would often tell people once we got the je- job that we were working on, one of our friends, I won't embarrass him by naming who him who he was. We told him we got the job and his response was, why? <laughs> our main other thing, we were, we were so unsuccessful at that point. I mean, even just to have a job was the real why. But other, other people seem to find the idea of like, oh, how do you make a Sonic the Hedgehog movie? But I felt like the four of us were like, I don't know. I mean, Sonic's a great character. What are you talking about? Yeah, he's a super powered <laughs> hero fighting a villain. Like, how do you make a movie out of that? That's like what movies are. Yeah, and, and it, <laughs> so all four of us, it felt like we were the only ones in the, the rooms who were, you know, it's basically like, how do you make a Spider-Man movie? And you're like, what? <laughs> <laughs> like, granted, there were hard things because Sonic canonically in the Sega universe doesn't really have a backstory or things like that. So that obvious that was the hard part but it wasn't hard for any of us to imagine like how how could a movie starring this great character be interesting yeah and i can tell you i saw i had a choice between tenet and sonic my friends chose tenet we watched tenet and i just kept thinking the whole time we should have watched sonic man <laughs> and i go <laughs> home i watched sonic and it was just it was a blast so i can't wait i love the was second that in one the drive-in so. is that uh, you no this was oh, okay. so uh they wanted to go to uh alamo which is like my favorite place to go went there and then I got home and Sonic was available. I mean, okay, well, I'm going to watch Sonic. And I think I watched it twice in a row. I'm like, this is great. What the, <laughs> why did we, yeah. So it, it washed away all my feelings for Tenet that I had like <laughs> three hours earlier. Um, but now you have the second movie, you have the third movie that, uh, you know, you're working on right now based on what IMDb is saying, is saying, sorry. Uh, but I want to talk about my most anticipated movie of this year. And that is Violent Night, man. Woo! I saw the trailer during barbarian and i think i almost broke my girlfriend's hand I'm like I, was, I just got so excited <laughs> like right right away uh but what was the inception of writing violent night because i mean you, we could look at silent night we could look at all these like christmas horror films of the 80s and the 70s but where did you guys come up with die hard with santa well that one goes i mean that goes back to our public access show was we'd done we actually talking about this recently we had done several like diehard parodies and homages. <laughs> yeah, on we the did show. like a, an episode where like terrorists took over the show and they were hosting the live show while one of our cast members was doing a diehard. We would cut away, <laughs> and then we that basically went over ripped so well. that off. Yeah, so then like for Christmas, we were like, "What are we gonna do for our Christmas special?" And we we're like, "Let's do the same thing, but this time it's Santa doing a diehard." Um, uh, and it was very different because that was more of like a bumbling Santa who was, you know, I guess. And that was one thing we were always proud of how Violent Night the movies turned out is I think a lot of people when they heard the concept probably would have imagined more like what we did in high school where Santa's just like, whoa, no, and like kind of haphazardly <laughs> uh, succeeding. But we were like, no, what? I mean, what if it just was like Die Hard? And Santa, uh, you know, they underestimated Santa and didn't realize that he's this super badass. I mean, and obviously this idea is so ridiculous. It is like an idea for a sketch or like a fake trailer you'd see on SNL. But that was the sort of thing as we thought about it and kind of like thought about like, what would Santa, what would a real Santa be like? Say Santa is real. What does that mean? You know, where did he come from? What's he really like? And how do we find a way to make this a real movie with a real arc and stuff you can care about? And it kind of once we started thinking about it, it all sort of fell into place very quickly. Like it was, it was a very clear idea ultimately. And we were like, yeah, we got to go out and pitch this and see if we can get anybody to bite. Uh, which we did. We were out pitching it at the exact moment, basically that Sonic one came out uh, like the night and of Sonic. right before COVID. That's the <laughs> an odd moment in time now in retrospect. So was it was it pretty hard to get someone to to bite onto that? Because the, the idea itself, when you're talking to other writers, we're all just full in. But talking to a studio, it's it's different. Yeah, right? I, I mean, don't did it know. Take a while? It's hard to say. Well, no, it, it, it happened super quickly. I was going to say it's hard to say what would have happened if we hadn't. Because the first people we well, we mentioned it to our agents and literally the day after we told them, our agents called us and were like, hey, I was talking to Kelly McCormick over at 87 North and they already knew that we we're fans uh of just their whole little world um and they're like david leach doesn't live in la at the moment but he's gonna be in town like tomorrow only we soft pitched them the idea which was basically just what if diehard was santa uh do you want you know and kelly wants to know do you want to meet with david and pitch it to him and we're like well yeah we didn't really have much of it figured out at that point but again i think if you can just get behind the idea diehard with santa 
you know, I think it's at least easy to understand if someone will be into it. Um, and then it was kind of that just- was the sort of pitch where it's like basically the pitch is what if Die Hard but Santa and right away you can tell whether or not they're into it and then the rest of the pitch is just sort of filling in details but like that that does get the idea yeah <laughs> but but you know 87 North ultimately was into it and I was going to say I guess I hard to say what the process would have been if we didn't have them and then we're just going out with it purely as a pitch. Um, cause it was, it was the kind of pitch that everyone thought was funny, but then you could kind of tell ultimately they were like, oh, we can't make that <laughs> like that. But the fact that we did insane. have Kelly and David on our side. So it's like, you knew the action was, we're going to really kick ass. Uh, it was funny. Some of the questions we got though, cause a lot of people would be like, but wait, he's like a mall Santa. And we were like, no, he <laughs> is Santa. You know, it's like, but what's, what's he dressed like? He's like, just full Santa. Dressed, he's the dressed like thing. Santa. <laughs> in fact if you don't dress him like santa i feel like you're ruining the idea <laughs> well i i can't wait to see it honestly it's i think it's out december 2nd right mm -hmm, and this right. will come out the week that it's coming out and i just I, I keep counting down the days but ever since um you know we scheduled this interview i was thinking about questions to ask you guys and i wanted to ask you know what is another character that you'd want to pull a diehard with of you know holiday <laughs> or mythical proportions have there been any talks just goofing around even about what other characters you'd want to see do a diehard? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, we have we have talked about how we could do kind of like a whole spin-off universe from Violent Night, but I think we would probably not want each of them to be a diehard scenario. <laughs> yeah. I know. I don't know if we have another diehard uh response. Yeah, it's funny we haven't thought about that now, but now I'm like, yeah, like is yeah, there wait, like what else can we die hard? <laughs> die hard that's like a period piece, maybe, you know? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> a 17th remake. century die hard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Queen <laughs> Victoria. <laughs> well, you guys spend obviously most of your day writing, coming up with ideas, and just you know, getting these worlds you're imagining onto paper and hopefully onto screen. What do you guys do to kind of decompress from that, to, to let go? Because you do have to separate yourself every now and again. So what uh, what do you like to do during the day, during the night, whenever, that allows you to truly relax and not think about storytelling, even though that's, that's very I mean, hard. my wife and I mostly just watch movies. So I feel like I'm <laughs> caught in an endless feedback loop in that sense. <laughs> yeah, a lot of movies. I mean, when I'm like really stressing out and have steam coming out of my ears, that's when I go, I... I'll go and play the piano or the guitar to just like soothe myself and bring my blood pressure down before I explode. You know, that that's a key coping mechanism. Uh, like acoustic versions of DMX songs in the dark, that kind of thing. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's, you've said it a couple times before, you know, a lot of things you've been through, uh, it's hard to give advice, you know, about how to navigate those situations, especially nowadays. But do you guys have any advice you could pass on to our listeners who are either trying to get into this industry or are in it right now or trying to stay in? Do you have anything you could pass along to them that you've personally held on to? I mean, I do think it's generic advice, but because it's so accurate is just make stuff and get it out there. Um, Cause I feel like the, the easy advice used to always be, you need to move to LA, which is still like a little true. It's just not as true as it was like 20, 30 years ago. Or even three years ago. Yeah. Really. <laughs> that, that has really changed with the rise of zoom. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. But yeah, get stuff and put it out there. Beyond yeah, that, it's finish so, things. Definitely like, finish if, things. If, like if, like if a lot of people have been working on this script for 20 years and like, what should I do? And I'm like, first of all, Put that in a drawer and start something new. That's yeah. been like, you know, come, come up with something fresh. I feel like you're too far down the rabbit hole on that one. Yeah, if you've been uh, working on the same thing for five years, unless you're actively making it, if you're like an animator and you've been, you know, squirreling away hours on your animated epic for the past 10 years, finish that. Uh, but yeah, if it's a script, I mean, I'm trying to think, Pat, like, I almost feel like if you've been working on the same script for a year, even that's too long. Like, you don't have to yeah. throw it away start something else and yeah. then loop back put to it, it away yeah yeah like if we were working on the same thing for a whole year we'd go insane like that's and be, that's and and be fired <laughs> and we'd be fired <laughs> <laughs> um and i guess the other thing is like when you're trying to break in yeah just like to you know be a little be a little wild and be a little bold in terms of your ideas you're putting out there it's like if you're trying to do 
the same thing long established professionals are already doing. It's like the studios and the networks aren't going to necessarily want to hire you to do it because they know people who do that. They want something fresh from you, the newcomer. And even now, I think this, this was more common, you know, back in like the 80s. Um, but because uh, I have a podcast called Best Movies Never Made, it's all about, as the title implies, movies that didn't get made or versions of movies that didn't get made. And it's, it over and over it comes up, though, just when I ask our guests, like, what's your origin story? You know, how'd you get into the industry? I'd say half of the time, it's always like I wrote this script. Uh, it kind of, you know, went around the town and everyone loved it. It didn't get made, but it's like that script then got them the big movie that they're known from, you know, mm -hmm. and that's still happening today. So I also think you don't overthink what your script is in the sense of it needs to get made. Obviously, it's a bummer to work on something and then just no one ever sees yeah, it's more fun product, when but, it gets made, certainly. But uh, I think that was to Pat's point is like write something that you think really shows off what a you're good at, but also be like will stand out, you know? Mm -hmm um because then you know maybe it'll wind up on the blacklist that's obviously the best case scenario for a thing that never gets made since those get kind of reported on and passed around a little bit but i mean funny even violent night uh which ultimately had a pretty quick turnaround from writing it to when it get ma got made but there was a full year where it was still kind of just hovering in like limbo and it wasn't like it did it wasn't that it didn't seem like it was going to get made. It was just kind of, it wasn't inching forward. But even in that year, we were able to use the script as a sample to get other jobs for things we're working on now that haven't got made yet. But yeah, like, this like put us from the just talking animal movies into play for other, you know, because this is rated R, it's an action movie. Like it sort of opened up just the existence of the script of Violent Night opened up what people thought about what we were capable of doing as writers and put us into the conversation for all sorts of different stuff. Um, and I can't wait to see what you guys do next. Like Violent Night, we're a couple weeks away. By the time this comes out, it'll be the week of. So everybody get your tickets and we're running out of time. But I do want to ask you guys if you would like to join me in an awkward goodbye. Uh, we, <laughs> we briefly mentioned Wayne's World earlier. Now, I'm not sure if you can recall the scene where Wayne leaves the new producer is taken over. There's like a blue screen going behind and Garth is losing his shit, uh, just being really <laughs> quiet. So what I'm going to do is uh, give you a three, two, one countdown cameraman style. When I point, just give me your best verbal awkward goodbye. You think you guys have something in the chamber for that? I'll try. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> All right, guys. <laughs> well, it was, a, it was a complete pleasure talking to both of you. I can't wait to see the movie. Can't wait to see what you do next. This was awesome. Uh, and yeah, let's do our awkward goodbye. Here we go in. Hey, I'm, uh, uh, I should, I gotta, I gotta go. I have to go to the bathroom. <laughs>